Hi, I'm Keith Farrell from Liverpool HEMA. I've been invited to take part in this year's Iron Gate exhibition, but unfortunately I can't be there with you in person. So I've recorded a presentation and I hope you enjoy it. I would like to speak today about Lichtenauer, common fencing and some of the lesser known sources. We're going to cover uh, a few different things. We'll look at what I think the Lichtenauer method was. We'll look at what I think common fencing might have been and therefore by defining the one, can we better define the other? We'll have a look at some of the, the better known sources, or at least the sources that I think seem to be uh, better known. And we'll ask the question if those might actually be the best sources for use, or if there might be something else that could be better used in our studies. We'll have a look at some of the lesser known sources, and we'll pose the question about what we can gain from studying those sources. I'd like to speak just a, a very little bit about my own recent translation efforts, and then I'd like to draw some conclusions. So let's start at the beginning. What was the Lichtenauer method? Who was Lichtenauer? Did he invent the arts? So what do we know? And therefore, what can we conclude? These are quite big questions, although they seem quite simple. Uh, they, they underpin a lot of our understanding of the art, or perhaps a lot of our misunderstanding of the art. So who was Lichtenauer? Well, in short, we don't know. There's not really much information about this. There are clues that could perhaps be pieced together, and some people have done a, a superb work in trying to do that, but there's nothing firm. At best, all we can say is we don't know much about Lichtenauer. That's incredibly unsatisfying. What, what else might we possibly know? Like, did he invent the art that he was writing about? I'd like to present this, this quick translation of uh, a passage from the Nuremberg House book. Uh, Hereafter is written Master Lichtenauer's art of fighting with the sword on foot and on horseback, unarmoured and in harness. And before all things and any fights, you should note and understand that there is just one art of the sort, and this was invented many hundreds of years ago. This is the foundation and core of all arts of fencing, and Master Lichtenauer knew it and understood it completely. He did not invent the art, as was written before. Instead, he travelled through many lands, and through this he sought the right and true art, so that he would learn it and know it. I think that's quite an interesting little passage right from the very beginning of the, the gloss in the, the Nuremberg House book. And it says in black and white, Lichtenauer did not invent this art. He learned it from other people, or at least he learned quite a lot. And therefore, from what he learned, he was able to put together this settle and synthesize the entirety of his knowledge into a a relatively few short verses. What else do we know? Lichtenauer composed a, a three-part settle that could perhaps be translated as a, a poem, a summary, or even a, a schedule, like in the sense of a legal schedule of work. As a, he composed a three-part settle for fencing on foot without armour, on horseback, and on foot in armour. And this settle was copied and glossed or explained throughout the 15th century and also into the 16th century. It was a superb medium for propagating the art, or at least the, this type of information about the art. Whenever the settle is, is mentioned in the various sources, it is often uh, attributed to Lichtenauer. And in the attribution, in the Codex Danzig, in 1452, his name is followed by the traditional phrase for paying honour to the dead. That means he can you know, he was no longer alive by that time in the mid-15th century. So that gives us a sense of when he lived until, and that maybe can help, help us shape our understanding of when he maybe did live. Uh, it, it would be reasonable to suggest that he was alive in the late 14th century into the early to mid 15th century, or there and thereabouts, plus and minus some. It really doesn't help that we don't know an awful lot. 
he did seem to have a group of students or colleagues, the Gesellschaft Lichtenauers. Uh, Paul, Paulus Kell, writing in roughly 1470, listed the members of this Gesellschaft, this company or society. And although some of these people seem to have been alive in the mid 15th century, because, for example, in the Codex Danzig in 1452, their names are not followed by the traditional honor for the dead. Uh, by the time Paulus Kell was writing in 1470, the, the last line of that, uh, that little section seems to suggest that all the members of that society were dead. The settle that Lichtenauer composed could be indicative of some form of education, the art of rhetoric, the, the scholastic method of, of learning and teaching and transmitting information to others. That is a, a huge area worth an in-depth discussion by itself. I, I don't have the time or the scope to go into it here, but I think it's a reasonably simple thing to say and probably reasonably true to say that only an educated person could have composed the settle the way it was done. The Nuremberg House book that, we, that, that, that I quoted from uh, makes reference to physics and to Aristotle. And this is quite important because this was the understanding of physics and how the world worked uh, that people knew and understood in the 15th century. Our concept of the world and how the world works is based on Newtonian physics, which came about somewhat later. In the 15th century, when Lichtenauer was writing these things and le learning these things in the first place, it would have been the Aristotelian physics that he would have known and used to describe things. And again, perhaps this, this points to uh, an indication of education. And thus, what might we conclude about Lichtenauer and his method? Now, we've, we've gone through this very swiftly, but if we're just taking a, a fairly simple uh, zoomed out point of view in the matter, Lichtenauer's settle was an educated summary and distillation of the essence, essential information about fighting on horseback and on foot, both with and without armour. Keywords being educated. And also summary and distillation. It was this codification into the settle that allowed the written knowledge of the art of fencing to propagate as it did throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. If he had written his art in a different fashion, it may not have propagated so well. It may not have been as easy to disseminate and then for other people to copy and disseminate further. The fact that he wrote a settle that could then be glossed and explained and copied and replicated, this was probably one of the big reasons why Lichtenauer's method uh, came to be so well known and so well written about. I would suggest, this is my, my theory, my my point of view, that the settle for Blosfechten was ultimately just an academic essay on the most efficient way to fight on foot, without armour, with any sword held in both hands, according to physics, according to the physics that they knew at the time. Just like at university today, the, the professor will pose a question to be answered, and your essay has to answer that question and nothing else. If the question posed to Lichtenauer was, what is the most efficient way to fight on foot without armour, with a sword and two hands, according to physics, then the settle would be his very fancy, very educated answer to precisely that question and nothing else. I think if we understand that that is what Lichtenauer was trying to do, we can put it into, I think, quite a reasonable context, and we then don't run the risk of making problematic other assumptions about his audience, his intention, what he meant by this or that, if we assume that it was just something like an essay or to answer this sort of question, then that, that sets the scene very nicely and very simply. Set against the Lichtenauer method, what was the common fencing of the day? We could perhaps use a variety of different phrases to talk about this. 
And over the years, various people have used different phrases, uh, phrases to talk about this sort of thing. You might hear it talk, talked about as common fencing or commonplace fencing, or as customary fencing or ordinary fencing, general fencing, possibly even vulgar fencing, if we want to use one of the terms from the Iberian sources. I might define it as the sort of fencing that was commonly or widely known and practiced. We don't have to, to cast any aspersions in, in using any of these terms. We can acknowledge that there was some kind of fencing that was commonly known and commonly practiced and that most people would have known and done. And I think that's what we should be talking about when we are considering common fencing. What techniques are often mentioned in the common fencing sources? Well, quite a lot of them, actually. And we can recognize a lot of these from the Lichtenauer method. They talk about the Oberhal, the Unterhal, and the Mittelhal. Uh, perhaps even some of the named techniques, like the Zornhal and the, the Zverhal. There are other techniques, named techniques, that don't necessarily appear in Lichtenauer. The Flugelhal, the Kronhal, and the Streichen. Now, one of the sections in the Dringek Dresden manuscript does talk about the Streichen, but that wasn't necessarily written by Ringek, and it's not a straight gloss of the, the Zettel, so that's a, a little bit different. We see the technique of the, the Sprechfenster mentioned and discussed, although it tends to mean something a bit different from what it means in Lichtenauer. And that's a, that's a recurring theme, although some of the, the names might seem very familiar, the meanings might be quite different. We see mentions of Versetzen, Absetzen, Ansetzen. These are words that are quite common. We have the concepts of Anbinden and Winden, so actions upon the blade. There are actions away from the blade, such as Durchwechsel, with cuts and thrusts. There are the techniques to do, or, and, and the concepts to do with with time and who gets to do what in the fight, such as for, nach, and indis. And there are other things like wrestling and disarms. But if we were to think about um, this list, there's a lot of them that sound familiar. There are some that don't sound familiar. And a lot of the, the sources make up new names for the, the various things that they talk about. But a lot of them do use terminology that is similar to Lichtenauer. The Kölner Fecht book is fantastic for this. It uses a lot of terminology that's very similar to what we see in Lichtenauer, but so many of the techniques, so many of the names used uh, mean something totally different. It's really hard, it's really difficult to go into the, the Kölner Fecht book assuming you know what it means because you've read Lichtenauer, because <laughs> so many of the, the terms mean something else. And you'll see that I've emboldened the, the term Flugelhau here. I think it's one of the most important items in this list. And I would, say, I would go as far as to say, if we want a litmus test to, to determine if a source is an example of common fencing or an example of the Lichtenauer method, we should look and see if it talks about the Flugelhau. If it talks about the Flugelhau, it is probably common fencing. And if it doesn't mention the Flugelhau, it's either... A, a different strand of common fencing, or it is the Lichtenauer method. Lichtenauer doesn't talk about the Flugelhau at all. He has things like it, sure, but he doesn't use that term. But a lot of the common fencing sources do have that technique with that term. What skills are often described in the common fencing sources? Well, we have to read between the, the lines a little bit, or sometimes look at what is said. So the little phrase, the, um, the statement that something takes away what comes from above is quite common. Did other authors borrow that from Lichtenauer? Or did Lichtenauer perhaps borrow a common phrase from the fencing that he, he learned elsewhere? There's a skill of going to different openings or even creating openings to which to go. This is one of the, the big parts of common fencing, I think, that and sequences, the use of different kinds of sequences to, to be able to go to different openings, 
to create openings, to, to be able to do this or that or whatever. And alongside sequences, we have the concepts of pattern recognition and being able to break patterns, preferably on your own terms. There are the skills of quite simple parrying, of striking with the flat, something we don't see very much in Lichtenauer. But there's also the perhaps um, less explicit, uh, less tangible skills of just mental agility in general, being able to change between your plans. That's quite a, a common theme in the common fencing sources. There's a theme of physicality using the whole body. That chimes very well with what Lichtenauer says. And bravery, courage, developing your spirit, developing your honour, perhaps becoming well known as a good fencer. Again, this chimes very well with the, the start of Lichtenauer's settle. We could summarise a little bit and say that common fencing includes a wide variety of actions and skills. There's nothing wrong or poor or inadequate or anything negative about common fencing. We could consider the methods of the fencing guilds and the Fechtschulen. Now, if, if you happen to know any of the rules about how competitions were done in the, the 15th and 16th centuries, you'll see there's a lot of a lot of similarity between that and the fencing methods uh, described in the common fencing sources. There are perhaps phrases and proverbs that could have been widely known. Like, for example, we have the, the proverb in English today that a stitch in time saves nine. And that's very similar to uh, prevention is better than cure. If you take time up front to prevent a disease or to do one stitch before the, the problem becomes any worse, you'll save yourself having to cure yourself later or having to do nine stitches later when the problem has developed and has become worse, has become more problematic. So we have these phrases and proverbs. We also have things like a rapier wit that people use commonly, even if they aren't fencers. Uh, and the, the sharp wit is perhaps referring to making like a, a sword-like reference. So maybe Lichtenauer developed some of these phrases and proverbs, and from Lichtenauer they became widely known, or maybe some of these proverbs were in fact in common circulation. And part of the strength of Lichtenauer's method, part of what made it so easy to copy and propagate was that he, he utilised the, the phrases and proverbs that were commonly known. We might say that common fencing involves a good set of simple things that you might reasonably do in a fencing bout. Nothing too fancy, nothing too difficult. And if you're stressed, if you're under pressure, then maybe all you need is a simple set of simple things. And that'll give you a, a good chance of carrying yourself through the match. It's also a good set of simple things for teaching to beginners. Uh, it's not a, the common fencing really doesn't seem to assume any competency or existing skill. It just suggests these are some things you can do and its use of sequences throughout the vast majority of the, the common fencing sources. Uh, it creates a fantastic vehicle or training format to equip people with simple skills. And so I would say that it was from all of this that Lichtenauer drew his material for his settle. He didn't invent it. He learned the art from many people. And from that, he synthesized his settle. For everything that we do in HEMA, we try and base it on sources, or at least that's, that is the basis of the activity of HEMA. We have sources that describe a lot of this information and therefore we can read those sources and learn things and try and do it that way. Some of the better known sources that probably most people will have heard of at least some point in time would be the, the Nuremberg House Book or sometimes called the, the Paul Manuscript or the, the, the Dobringer Manuscript. It's from the, the 1400s. It contains quite a lot of valuable information. There's a gloss by Yudlev, 
it's, it is glossing the settle, it's explaining the settle. It's from the mid 15th century. There's an anonymous gloss in the, the, the Codex Danzig, again, middle of the 15th century. There's another gloss by Sigmund Einringek. What we have available to us now are various 16th century copies, although there probably was an original version of that gloss in, I would guess, the mid 15th century. You've probably heard of Paulus Meyer from the, the mid 16th century and Joachim Meyer from slightly after the mid 16th century as well. These are names that most people have probably heard of. And at some point, most people have probably read something to do with these authors, seen their illustrations, looked in some amount of detail at their work. Other names that people might know about uh, would be Hans Talhofer, that's quite commonly known. Paulus Kahl, maybe slightly less commonly known. Peter Faulkner, it should be reasonably well known, but maybe isn't always. Jörg Wilhelm, people have maybe seen some of the, the wackier illustrations, uh, but that's quite an important early 16th century gloss of the, the Zettel, albeit with a few additions. What about the Codex Wallerstein? That's one that maybe used to be a little bit better known. Um, I'm not sure that as many people are aware of it anymore, but that might just be where I am in the world. What about Andre Parnfeind? Again, used to be quite well known when it was one of the, the few sources that people knew about. But now that we know about more sources in general, I think a lot of people have um, maybe a, a slightly less broad knowledge of all the various sources available. And what about the Kölner Fecht book? It used to be not very widely studied, but more recently, I think more people are coming to know about it, which makes me happy because it's one of my favorite sources. So, so there are quite a lot of sources it, within the, the German canon. There's, there's probably in excess of 70 handwritten manuscripts or printed books that are useful for talking about or describing the art of fencing. 70, more than 70. That's quite incredible. We have such a wealth of information, but of course not everyone can be fluent in all of them. So there tends to be some sources that are better known that most people will tend to refer to. Are these the best sources to use? Well, the glosses of Lichtenauer's Zettel, I would say, are the best sources for studying what I would call core Lichtenauer. So if you want to do Lichtenauer the way that Lichtenauer was doing his method, then the best information we have would be the Zettel, except it's painfully cryptic. So the glosses that explain the Zettel. That gives us a good insight into what that core Lichtenauer method would be. Other sources that do not gloss the Zettel are maybe less helpful for studying core Lichtenauer, but nonetheless, they, they do have value. They can shine some light in the common fencing. They can give us little further bits of information that help to inform our core Lichtenauer method. But do, does any one source, does any small group of sources tell the, the, the whole story? No, there's no way that something as complicated as the entire art of fencing could be recorded in one, one single book, or even, I think, a small number of books. There's always information missing. There's always another way to think about it. There's always another way to represent these ideas that will click with someone else. What about some of the lesser known sources? Hmm. So we've talked about the Codex Wallerstein. It's, it's quite an interesting one. It's definitely common fencing, I would say, but it uses a lot of terms that are similar to the, the Lichtenauer method. But I think it describes a method of fencing that is not trying to do what the Lichtenauer method was trying to do. Uh, I think it was written for a, a big, strong person who liked being big and strong. And while I find that very amusing, that's not me. 
So I don't always manage to fence in a, a style that is congruent with the, the Codex Wallerstein. But nonetheless, it has some quite interesting ideas and, and it can be quite useful for fleshing out some of our investigations of fencing. What about Martin Sieber? Have any of you heard of, of this author? It's, it's an interesting little source and it contains I think some gems, for example, one of the lines is that in all bindings, you should turn your short edge forward. Now, I don't think that's 100% true because there are some ways of binding on when you don't want to turn your short edge forward because the wrist doesn't really bend like that. But there are other methods of, of binding on, such as when you, you strike an Oberhau from your dominant shoulder down onto the, the opponent's sword. If you turn your short edge forward instantly, then you're setting up for all of the Wienden that Lichtenauer would describe. So th little things like that, it's, it's, it's not putting the, the emphasis onto the, the winding action or the, the complicated terminology. It just gives a, a simple, straightforward, quite actionable instruction. When you bind on, turn your short edge forward, and that sets you up for everything else. Seeing that line really helped me understand in, in my head what uh, Wienden is about and how to take advantage of my opponent's sword in the bind. What about Peter Falkner towards the end of the 15th century? He was in fact a captain of the, the Marx Bruder Fencing Guild and he wrote a, a manuscript that looks very similar to Talhoffer's in many, way, many ways, but is, is different in a few others. But some of the ways that he illustrates things, some of the ways that he talks about things, it's quite different to what we normally think about. For example, if we were to think about chaining a pair of Zverhauen from one side to the other, you know, we'd think about maybe throwing the, the short edge Zverhau to your, your opponent's left ear and then slamming around making the, the long-edged Sverhau to your opponent's right ear. Except Peter Falkner seems to show the first Sverhau with the short edge being slung directly straight forward at the centre of your opponent's face. And then with a triangle step, and the triangle footwork is a, a common item in the common fencing, you can apply the cross wrist long-edged Sverhau to the back of your opponent's head. That's quite a different way from how we often think about it. It might be worth returning to Peter Falkner and having a look at what he shows and how he talks about things and allowing, allowing yourself to think, how does this change how I understand things? There's the Kölner Fecht book. I've already said that's one of my, my favorite sources. I've been working with it for uh, probably a bit over a decade now. And I think it's fantastic. It is so different from Lichtenauer in so many ways. It's also really similar to Parnfeind, who did things a bit differently from Lichtenauer, certainly, but also quite a large part of Parnfeind's treatise was following and glossing Lichtenauer. So there's a, a really interesting uh, path of deviation away from the, the Lichtenauer method. Or maybe it's not deviation away from the Lichtenauer method. Maybe it's just working back and showing more of the earlier stages that led to the, the Lichtenauer method. Even though the, this treatise itself dates from quite a lot later, uh, perhaps it is still quite a good example of the common fencing that led to Lichtenauer's method. Has anyone had, heard of Jobst von Württemberg? It's a fascinating little treatise that talks about the, the art of fencing with the, the six master strikes, all of which are done with the short edge, including the Zornhal. That's very different from what Lichtenauer talks about. And yet it's using some of the same ideas, the fact there's a, a small set of strikes that are worth focusing on for some reason. And some of the follow-ups to the, the six master strikes done with the short edge, 
um, sound very much like what Lisa and I would advise you to do. So for example, the short edge Sornhal is followed by stabbing him in the face, which sounds very much like the Sornhal art, except it's you don't have to do much of a Vinden anymore if you already have your short edge forward. And then that begins to sound like the advice from Martin Sieber that in all bindings, turn your short edge forward. Well, what if you don't have to do that because you just strike with the short edge anyway? Hmm, interesting. I've been working with Hans Chinner recently. Uh, that's quite an interesting poem uh, that Chinner wrote. And it, it mentions a variety of techniques, some of which sounds very familiar uh, to the Lichtenauer method, but it also talks about the psychology of the fencer. And that's fascinating because that's not something that Lichtenauer talks about at all. It's something that Meyer talks about, but not Lichtenauer. Do we think it could be useful to have an insight into the psychology of fencing as well as the physical practice? I, I would say so. So that's quite a useful little piece to, to think about in addition to the, the, the instructions about what to do physically. There's a, an interesting little sheet called the Anonymous Unicum that was found within the, the Dürer Fecht book. And it seems to be a set of flourishes, like a set of five flourishes, or five katas almost, possibly for the, the larger two-handed sword, you know, perhaps for just general physical practice or perhaps for uh, equipping people with the ability to use larger weapons. But it's quite an interesting and quite a different sort of treatise using not much of the Lichtenauer terminology, but some of the common fencing terminology, like, for example, the, the, the flugelhau. So it's linked to the, the material we're studying, but might, might involve a slightly different weapon. It might involve quite a different context or purpose of use. It might be worth studying a little bit so that you can form some of your own thoughts about it and form some thoughts about how it links with everything else. What about Hans Medel? That's a name that you might have heard of, but to be honest, most of the time, when I've heard people talking about Medel, it's been along the lines of, what on earth is that guy talking about? It's, it's quite, a, quite an interesting, quite a detailed source. I, I say that everything's interesting. I find all of this quite interesting. <laughs> but it, Medel is quite a, quite a detailed source that is quite different from the Lichtenauer method, except it then uses a lot of the same terminology and quite a lot of the same uh, structures and tactics and that sort of thing, just different. From that point of view, it's quite like Paulus Meyer. A lot of the same terminology, a lot of the same structures and shapes, just put together very differently. The Fecht book line, the Little Fencing Book, is a treatise I've been working on and translating recently, but it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the late now tradition at all. In fact, it's probably more in line with the anonymous unicum in terms of talking about the, the flourishing with the big sword for physical training or for some other similar purpose. How much relevance does it have to the study of uh, German fencing with the, the long sword in the 15th and 16th century? I'm not entirely sure because I'm not, I'm not finished my translation yet. I, I think it's, it's got some ideas about physically working with a sword that are worth considering and that might help improve uh, the mechanics and the just the fluency of handling the sword. And while that's not strictly connected to the Lichtenauer tradition, I think we can all agree that you're a better fencer if you can move the sword more easily. Two more. There's an interesting treatise. <laughs> Again, interesting. Everything's so interesting. There's a fascinating treatise by this person, Balthazaro Cremonio Pomerano from the mid to late 16th century. It is, it's just a, a single broadsheet that was found 
folded within a copy of Meyer and a copy of uh, von Gundrat. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's an example of circle fencing. And that's something that Meyer was working on in his Rostock manuscript before he died. Um, looking at the Drapier section in that manuscript, it's got a lot of circles, or well, rather ovals. And it seems to be a, a new pedagogical method that some of the fencing masters around that time in the 16th century were experimenting with. Maybe this was a different way of them setting down their thoughts. Maybe it was a different way that they were trying to communicate their art. I don't know. But this is another example by another fencing master of using circle diagrams to try to communicate fencing skills. It's quite short. It's quite to the point. And I think it's a great summary of some of the, the basics of how to fence with good structure and good decisions. That's definitely worth having a look at if you want to, to consider some of the 16th century longsword fencing, but from quite a different angle. And finally, we have the, the second part of the new art-rich method of fencing from the, the late 16th century. It's fantastic. It has nothing at all to do with the Lichtenauer tradition, except a lot of the techniques are broadly similar to what we find in common fencing. The terminology is all different. The illustrations are very different. The, the look, the stylistic appearance of how they're using their bodies to, to create the fencing, that's very different. But this gives us uh, another, another perspective on how the fencing was done, how the fencing was perhaps talked about, and maybe um, some clues about uh, a different tradition of fencing that didn't have all that much in common with the Lichtenauer terminology. I love this one a lot, especially the pictures. If you've had a, a chance to look at this book, the, the illustrations are <laughs> very entertaining. Uh, but I think the, the fencing skills within it are superb, and I often use this as a way to introduce my beginners to, to working especially with the Dusak. Whew, that was quite a lot of information for still quite a relatively short list. Turns out there are quite a lot of lesser known sources, and they all have something quite interesting to bring to the table. So what can we gain from these? Well, if we zoom out from all of that stuff that I was just saying, a lot of these sources provide variations on the normal themes. If we assume that normal is how Lichtenauer talks about it, these sources provide variations on the norm. We also talk about really quite different alternative solutions. The more tools that you have in the toolbox, perhaps the more problems you can solve, or the more ways you have to give it to, to solve any specific problem. And so these sources might provide additional tools for the toolbox to, to make sure that we, we have all the necessary skills, all the necessary options, all the necessary uh, choices and information. They can also provide small snippets that can help to explain things further, such as Martin Sieber's advice to turn the short edge forward in all bindings. If that is at the heart of the concept of Winden, maybe we don't need to, to, to waste our time with some of the, to be honest, batshit crazy versions of, of Winden that we've seen over the years, that I myself have taught over the years until I've learned that batshit crazy tends not to be very effective or efficient and, to be honest, simple and straightforward and functional tends to provide the best results. The sources can provide information about the psychology of fencing um, or possibly even the psychology of the fencers themselves. And I think that's fascinating. They can provide ways to play the game. They don't need to involve the five strikes or Vinden. So often when people are talking about um, fencing, you know, especially in, in, in tournaments and we hear the criticism, oh, that's, that's not proper Lichtenauer, there's not enough Vinden going on or that can't be proper Lichtenauer, I didn't see the five strikes. That's, that's quite, um, quite gatekeeping in many ways. And not every bout needs to display Winden or the five strikes or Durchwechsel or whatever. 
because the best way to fence is what is going to work against this particular person, especially when considering the assorted stimuli that that person is likely to give you. So having more ways to play the game means that you can probably give a good account of yourself against more people. We can gain corroborations of what some of the basics might have been. You know, what do you teach to your beginners? What are the basics, the fundamentals of fencing? Quite lots of the sources seem to disagree. But then some of these sources maybe help to, to corroborate what this might have been. And that can help us perhaps develop ideas for exercises and lessons for our own beginners today. I think if all we study are the, the glosses of Lichtenauer, then we might be creating classes and curricula that are difficult for our beginners to really get into and understand. But if we can include some of the information from some of the common fencing sources or some of the just the lesser known sources in general, this can make it much more accessible for our beginners today. My own recent translation efforts, um, I quite like translating, not necessarily great at it, but I find it quite an interesting way to engage with the source material and I find it helps me understand the source material better. It's a huge amount of effort to translate the big glosses. You know, something like the um, anonymous gloss in the Codex Danzig or the Ringgit gloss, or, you know, can you imagine sitting down to, to have a crack at Meyer? You know, either Paulus Meyer or Joachim Meyer, they're both huge, huge texts. And it's, it's difficult to, to do that because it requires so much time. Smaller, more interesting sources <laughs> are smaller in scope, and I think more, more motivating because I can see that the end is, is in sight. You can maybe bang out a translation of a small source in two or three hours, whereas two or three months or more might be a more feasible timescale for one of the big glosses. Since I already have quite a good understanding of what I think core Lichtenauer fencing is, then what else is there in the literature? You know, do, do I make the, the assumption that anything which isn't glossing Lichtenauer is not complete or not good enough? Or do I think that perhaps it might be shining uh, other lights on the, the art of fencing and that there's something useful for me to learn? And if I think the latter, which I do, then maybe it's worth spending some time translating and working with these sources. So I've been working on a variety of lesser known sources recently, uh, including this small list here, Master Andreas, Hans Chinner, uh, Balthazaro Carmonio Pomerano, Franz Hogenberg and the Fechtbuch line, and some others. Uh, some of these I have published and they're uh, available free of charge on my website at keithfarrell.net. Some of them I'm still working on, so they're not available yet. But mostly, this is, is giving me a lot, of, a lot of ways to maintain my own interest in fencing, even though I've been doing, I've been involved with HEMA for about 15 years now, and I'm still finding it fascinating. There's still new things to, to learn and pick up. I, I'd hesitate to say that I, I know it all perfectly. In fact, I think that's patently false. I've got some good ideas. And many of the good ideas that I have, I think, are informed by looking at the sources beyond just the, the best known ones. So to bring this to conclusion, because we've been speaking for a while now, we looked at the difference between Lichtenauer and common fencing. And my theory is that common fencing was the, the fencing that was commonly known, commonly done. And Lichtenauer learned that in his many travels to many lands and learning from many masters. And he synthesized it, he cut it down, he made a subset of the entire art of fencing. And that subset was the most efficient ways of using a sword in two hands, according to the physics known at that time. So in our practice today, what is the goal and focus of your practice? Are you trying to do core Lichtenauer? Are you trying to do common fencing? Or are you mainly just doing long sword in general without much reference to the source material? And these are all fine, perfectly fine. There are so many reasons for people to be involved with HEMA. We, we shouldn't be exclusionary. But it's good to know what we're actually doing 
<laughs> and to have that honesty about what we're doing and what we're not doing. Because if we can define what we're actually trying to do, then we can ask ourselves what sources are most relevant to that goal and focus. And we can find those sources and focus upon them and learn the best information to achieve the goals which are specific and appropriate to ourselves. But then we can also ask the question, are there any other sources that might help to flesh out your understanding or that might give you ideas or even just motivation to continue? Once you've read the best known sources, which are probably going to be the sources you're most likely to read first, the other sources might be what keep you interested or keep you learning things for the next many years. So I hope you found this interesting. It's been very quick and very light on, on many details, but that's because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to stick to the question. I'm trying to stay within my scope and I'm trying not to go down too many rabbit holes. I've got a timer running and that's 45 minutes now. So I really need to, to finish things up. I hope that's been interesting. I hope it gives you a bit of uh, inspiration to go and read some other sources, not just the best known ones. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me uh, through the contact form on my website at keithfarrell.net, or you can find me on Facebook. And I'm more than happy to talk about this sort of thing. Or if you'd like to book some, some private tuition online, I'm more than happy to arrange some, some sessions over Zoom and we can work on this in a bit more detail. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Iron Gate exhibition. And I hope to see you in person at some point soon. Bye.